grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome to our service here in the Coombs Coombe Benefice here at Pip and Jim's Church in Ilfracombe. We're very pleased to have you with us. Just a few notices as we begin. The first is, of course, we are continuing our Lent series on the 39 Articles using the book Foundations of Faith. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are already into that and uh, starting to, to delve in. Of course, it's never too late to, to try and catch up or to start uh, from where we are. So if you're not already doing that, why not give it a go? Um, on our website, in fact, underneath this video that you're watching now, you should see two links to be able to buy the resource. One is an e-publication, one's a paperback. Um, a link to the 39 articles on the Church of England website, but then also a link to a modern translation, or, or transliteration, I suppose, of, um, of the 39 articles to make them a bit easier to understand. Uh, same concept, same, same content, uh, just with uh, more modern English. Two dates for your diary. Uh, one is just uh, to give you a heads up, just in case, that next Sunday is Mothering Sunday or Mother's Day, uh, depending on your preferred term and how you're celebrating it. Uh, just want to make sure that I hadn't passed anyone by. It's very easy to do. Uh, the second thing to note is that in two Sundays' time, that's the 21st uh, of March, is actually Census Day again. Um, it doesn't feel like 10 years since the last one, does it? But um, it has been 10 whole years. Um, so can I encourage you, as far as it is possible, uh, for you to fill in your census form on that date? The reason I'm bringing it up now is, one, it gives you time to think, just in case you need that time. Um, but also to say that to be able to do the, the census form, you'll need to be able to fill that in um, either online or, if you'd rather a paper copy, to request a paper copy. You'll also need your unique ident um, ID number, which they will have sent you in the post. Um, so if we get close to that date, uh, say maybe some, a day or so after Mother and Sunday, and you've not got your letter yet, it um, might be worth chasing that up. Census form is really important. Um, although I know it feels like another bit of admin, actually it's part of how we uh, play our part within uh, as citizens, as God's people in this place. Um, and it's a small way we can actually help p let get people's lives better. And one of the ways that works is the census um, records data of how things are. And the better we understand how things are, the better the government can make policies in terms of how it's um, responding to current issues. Um, and of course, this is not just a one-year thing, this is over the next 10 years. So to get it as accurate as possible, to get as many people as possible to fill it in, is really important. So yeah, please do try and get hold um, of that form um, and fill that in if you can. So now let's uh, continue in our worship together as we come to God to confess our sins uh, to him. So we say together, Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Now may the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sin and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Amen. And here's our collect prayer for today. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to the joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. So the night is past and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, 
set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Let's continue our worship now in song as we declare together, there is one name. Please pause your video. Today our reading from God's word comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. And it'll be read to us by Shula at Pip and Jim's. The reading this morning comes from John 2, 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money, changers, and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, Get these out of here! How dare you turn my father's house into a market! His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. And we respond to hearing God's word by declaring together that song from Hosea 6, the song of humility. Come, let us return to the Lord who has torn us and will heal us. God has stricken us and will bind up our wounds. After two days he will revive us and on the third day will rise us up that we may live in his presence. Let us strive to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the sunrise. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. O Ephraim, how shall I deal with you? How shall I deal with you, O Judah? Your love for me is like the morning mist, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For loyalty is my desire, not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. So let's take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We ask that that word may be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path as we follow in the way of Jesus. Amen. A couple of years ago now, well before the days of the pandemic, Hilary and I were on holiday in France, in our motorhome, and we were following along the course of the River Loire before heading further south for a while. And as we went along the Loire, we came across this little town called saint benoit sur loire which we'd never heard of, and looking quite an attractive little town, we decided to park up and go and have a look round. What struck us immediately was, although this was a fairly small to medium-sized French town, the church was enormous, and so we decided to go and have a look round. What struck us as we went into this church, apart from the fact that it was relatively speaking, very plain, was this tremendous sense of peace and of the presence of God. And as we went round, it became apparent, and had our French been better, we'd have realised this, 
that that church is the place that St Benedict was finally buried. His remains were brought from the Abbey of Monte Cassino and he was finally laid to rest in St Benoit sur Loire, St Benedict on the Loire. And it's interesting, isn't it? We have a tendency to focus on places, church buildings for some, festivals like Spring Harvest or Green Belt for others, as places where we particularly meet with God. Thin places, as the Celtic Christian tradition would call them. And for the people of Israel, of course, the temple was supremely the place where you met with God. The place where it was believed God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. And while there is some truth in that idea of thin places, our experience in St Benoit sur Loire is a definite example of that. Jesus' actions and words in the temple in today's Gospel reading point us in a rather different direction. We're probably very familiar with the story, the cleansing of the temple. But there's a bit of a puzzle when we compare John's account with the other three Gospels. John places the cleansing of the temple right at the start of Jesus' ministry, immediately after the miracle at the wedding in Cana. The other three Gospels place it firmly in the last week of Jesus' life. And from our 21st century perspective, we want to ask, well, who's right? Did this happen in Jesus last week or at the beginning of his ministry? Or did it happen twice, perhaps? Most commentators now agree that the event only took place once and in the last week of Jesus' life. John, however, was arranging his material thematically and not chronologically. So he placed it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry to highlight its significance for understanding the course of Jesus' life and ministry. So it provides a good clue, a vital clue, for understanding the nature of Jesus' work and the way that it played out. So in the wedding at Cana, which comes immediately before the cleansing of the temple in John's Gospel, we see the blessings of God's kingdom shown in the abundance of the wine, replacing the water for ceremonial washing of the Old Covenant. Then in the cleansing of the temple, we see the focus of worship being purified and redirected. So let's take a closer look at the Gospel reading. And the cleansing comes into two parts, really. The cleansing itself and then Jesus' explanation of what he had done when he was challenged. And the key to the cleansing of the temple is that quote from Zechariah, Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Now, there was nothing wrong in selling oxen and sheep and doves in itself. It was actually providing a really important service for those who had travelled to Jerusalem from a distance, as all observant Jews were required to do at Passover and the other major festivals. They just wouldn't have been able to take animals for sacrifice with them. Nor was there necessarily anything wrong with what the money changers were doing. They were changing common currency, which would have had the head of the emperor and his insignia on it, and therefore would have been unclean, because, as we read in today's Old, Exodus, yeah, today's Old Testament reading in Exodus, Exodus 20, God says, you shall not make any graven image. And yet, on the common currency, there was the emperor's head and insignia, and the emperor was worshipped. So the money changers were changing that common currency into coinage that could have been used in the temple. And although 
there is the suggestion in the other three Gospels that there was quite a bit of overcharging going on, both in the money changing and the selling of animals for sacrifice. That suggestion isn't there in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, what was at issue and what aroused Jesus' anger was where they were doing it. They were selling animals for sacrifice and changing money in the temple complex itself, in what was called the court of the Gentiles. It was the only part of the temple where non-Jewish God-fearers were allowed to come and worship, albeit at a distance and separated from the Jewish people who had also come to worship. And this area that was meant to be set apart for Gentile God-fearers had been turned into a bustling, noisy market. And as an, as an aside, it's interesting to reflect on today's Old Testament reading from Exodus 20, which is the giving of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 verse 10 contains the commandment about keeping the Sabbath holy. On it, it says, you shall not do any work, you your son or your daughter, or the sojourner who is within your gates. Now that word sojourner could be translated visitor or even foreigner. So going right back to the giving of the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath provision is designed to include people who may not have been Israelites. And then, Immediately after Jesus has driven out the merchants and money changers, he's challenged. What sign can you show us for doing this? He's asked. In other words, what authority do you have for what you've just done? And Jesus' enigmatic reply, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. A saying, of course, that was misquoted at his trial. Now, at one level, Jesus' words could be taken to mean that he was simply referring to his body as a temple, in the same way that Paul, in 1 Corinthians 6, refers to our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit. The claim that his body could and would be raised three days after his death was shocking enough. Everybody knew that dead people weren't raised back to life. But everything points to something much more profound and even more shocking than that. Jesus was effectively saying, from here on in, the focus for worshipping God is no longer the temple building, it's me. The risen Jesus will be the place where the glory of God is revealed where his forgiveness and renewal are experienced and where fellowship with God is grounded and maintained. And I think it's difficult for us to grasp what an earth-shattering thing that was to hear at the time. So what has all this got to say to us now? In our study of the 39 articles this coming week, we're going to be looking at articles 17 to 22. And three of those, articles 18 and 19 particularly, and to some extent 20, kind of fit in with this reading from John's Gospel. So two things to pick out. The first thing is that worship is a matter of enormous importance. Article 19 of the church talks about the church being the place where the word is preached faithfully and the sacraments are duly administered. And clearly for Jesus, worship was of enormous importance. Israel had lost sight of God's call on her to be the people who revealed God to the world. in the Gospel readings, sorry, in the Synoptic Gospels, during the cleansing of the Temple, Jesus talks about, my house 
shall be a house of prayer for all the nations. So in cleansing the temple, Jesus is protesting against the presence of trading with all its attendant bustle and noise within the precincts of the temple, a place dedicated to the prayerful seeking of God and the offering of awe-filled worship. And so the quality of what we offer in our worship services or the devotion with which we take part are of real importance. We come into the presence of the awesome living God. There's an American author, Annie Dillard, uh, who wrote a book called Pilgrim at, Tink at Tinker's Creek. And in that, uh, reflecting on her experience of attending her local church uh, where she lived in America at the time, she says this. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life jackets and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. It's Annie Dillard's way of reflecting on the fact that in worship we come into the presence of this magnificent, awesome, living God. And then the second thing to draw out is that Jesus is claiming nothing less than the refocusing of the entire worship of God's people around himself and his mission. Article 18 talks about salvation only being by the name of Christ. The temple will pass away not only because it is physically destroyed, but because it's no longer necessary. Jesus' body, offered up in sacrifice and raised up in power, will be the new temple where God and humanity, creator and creature, meet face to face. And so two questions for us to ponder on as we continue our journey through Lent. Firstly, are there things about the way that we do worship that could get in the way for people who are interested in the faith, but not yet disciples of Jesus. And then secondly, when we come to worship, what are we focusing on? Thank you, Steve, for helping us understand God's word better. May we go and live it to his glory. Well, now we're going to declare together our common faith as we declare the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This week our prayers have been written to, uh, for us by Jeanette from St Peter at Vincla in Martin. And I'll be reading them to us. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, Creator of all things, we give you thanks for the resources of our world, for the wonders and mysteries of the universe. Lord, help us to use wisely all you have given for the benefit of others, for the well-being of the earth, and for the glory of your holy name. Loving God, we place into your healing hands all who are suffering with the coronavirus or other illnesses in hospitals, in care homes or isolated in their own homes. We pray for the doctors, nurses and carers and all the emergency services and organisations that are helping at this difficult time. 
We pray for all the scientists who have given us the vaccines, and we thank them for their dedication. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, as we see the darkness of our world, we pray for our brothers and sisters in areas of the world who live under the shadow of poverty and hunger, for those who live with injustice and greed, for those who have been broken and disabled by war. We pray for healing among nations, that your love will bring peace to all your children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, at this difficult time, show us where there is loneliness that we may take friendship. We pray for all families finding it hard to cope at this time of uncertainty. We pray for our young people as they prepare to go back to school and college. We pray for the teachers and all the staff, making it the safe environment for them to learn. Loving and Heavenly Father, We bring to you our families and friends, those that live near or far. Give to them your guidance and loving care through these troubled times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for our communities of our three churches. Be with those who are lonely and anguished. We pray for our mental health worker, Lisa, and all local organisations helping at this time of need. We pray for our vicar, our readers, and all who share in the life and work of your churches, keeping it a living presence that may others may enter to share your peace and love at these challenging times. Everlasting God, we ask you to help us too, making time for true preparations as we travel through Lent. Help us to find inner quietness and awareness of your presence. May we concern ourselves not so much with material things, but focus more on the spiritual gifts that you give us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we give thanks to God for that great generosity he shows us and the generosity that we can then show in return. We say together, Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. And gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we come towards the end of our service now, uh, I know for many of you, the thing on your mind will be the fact that our children are returning to school um, at some point this week. And so I think it's really important that we pause and we pray for them today. So would you join with me in in this prayer? Um, And then would you continue to be praying for our children and young people throughout this week? Let's pray. Lord God, you are always with us. You are with us in the day and in the night. You are with us when we're happy and when we're sad. You are with us when we're healthy and when we're ill. You are with us when we're peaceful and when we're worried. This week, as school returns, we ask you to be with everyone, no matter how we think or feel about going back. Help us to remember that you love us and are with us in everything we experience this week. Amen. And now, hear this prayer and blessing over all of us. God the Father, who has given to his Son the name above every name, strengthen you to proclaim Christ as Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all who love his name, this day and forever. Amen. Amen.